Don't Let Me Die, The Hyler Chronicles, by Charles Shepard, and edited by John Moniz. Chapter 1. Baseball Blunder. Today is Saturday, October 25th, 2114. Here in Ripville, a community of about 4,000 citizens, the Rippin' Harvest Festival has just ended. This annual three-day festival celebrates our gratitude to the Infinite One for the harvest. In the downtown area, there was an array of delicious foods to eat. Bands played. There was dancing in the streets. There was games to play and prizes to win. The festival shortened the school week by two days, and I liked that. I loved the potato sack and three-legged races. I will never forget the scrumptious corn dogs. After all, what is a festival without corn dogs? Most of all, I loved the chili cook-off which my mother always seemed to win. Her chili was legendary, and in my opinion, the best in the world, hands down. It was so good that it made all who tasted it long to come back for seconds. She never revealed her secret, but there seemed to be something extra that wooed the crowd and the judges year after year. People from all the neighboring vicinities within the region would come for this occasion. It was a good time, to be had by all and it always ended with the playing of the Harvest Championship Baseball Classic at the park on B Street and featured teams from all around. My team had managed to make the championship game for the third year in a row. I played center field, and we were up by a run in the bottom of the seventh with one out to go. Crack! Went the ball as it left the bat, like one of the old artillery shells that I had read about in my history class. That ball had been hit so hard that it looked as if it was sure to leave the park. It had to be my misfortune that made the ball come towards me. As it drew near, I could hear the crowd as they stood and shouted, Catch it! They were in a complete frenzy and I could understand why. Last year on a similar play, I had dropped the ball and cost my team the game. As the ball approached, my senses became heightened. A grim thought crossed my mind. If I dropped the ball, I might well become the scapegoat of this maniacal, savage mob. I ran back and placed myself in front of the fence so, so that I may have a chance to make a play on this well-hit tater. As I ran towards the fence, I felt a dull throbbing ache in my right ankle. I had tripped over a sprinkler head. Damn it, I said to myself as I fell to the ground. The ball flew over my head and made its way towards the top of the cyclone fence, which stood about five feet in height. As the ground began to draw near, I hit face first and then landed in a puddle. Further evidence of the broken sprinkler which had already inflicted its damage. As I landed, I heard a thud, which made the crowd gasp. I looked up, and I could not believe what I saw. The ball had fallen back into the field of play. That meant that I had a chance for a play at the plate. I turned, got up as fast as I could, and grabbed the ball. The crowd continued to cheer. The guy who had smashed the ball was already rounding third base and on his way home, while the lead runner had already scored. I had to try to throw out this five-tool freak of nature or face the disdain of the crowd and bench, so I took a deep breath, threw the ball home, and prayed for a miracle. This guy was running at breakneck speed, but my ball was closing in on him. All eyes were focused on the play. That would be close. Gary Sherman, our catcher, had his gloves spread wide as he waited on the ball and took his stand up the third base line in front of the dish. As this prodigy made his way, speeding down the line, and then slid, the ball flew towards his glove. At once, the ball hit Gary's glove, while those in the stands jumped to their feet and hoped for the best as the two combatants prepared for the collision. Then they collided, and Gary dropped the ball. Safe! shouted the umpire. I lowered my head as the booze began to rain down all around me. I couldn't believe it. I had thrown a seed that was on target. But Gary had dropped it during the blaze, and had allowed the winning run to cross the plate. My friend Simon P. Johnson ended up as a losing pitcher. The game was over. There was nothing more that I could do. My coach's face turned beet red as he ran out and raged towards home plate. What are you, blind? He was out, coach exclaimed. He's safe, the umpire insisted. We ran over to see how the alteration would turn out. He's out, fatso, my coach retorted. He's safe and that's final. Now get out of my face, you husker, yelled the umpire. What did you call me? asked Coach, somewhat perturbed and angered by the statement. You're a corn lover. You grow corn to feed the masses. 
You and these rip-filled tiny townies live in a bubble. You live in a nice, safe, secure place, but you never consider what might lay beyond them. You go on with your monocle chronic lies or acting as if the world outside didn't exist. Yelled the umpire while he took off his mask. He was the town sheriff and officiated the games on Saturdays because there was no one else who was willing to take on this liability. He had no children and was less inclined to worry about it. Besides, he loved the game, and because of his position as sheriff, no one dared to risk arguing with him and getting into further trouble. I am a husker? Well, you're an officer who has no respect for life. Then Coach grimaced and put his hands on his chest. Oh, he groaned while he fell on the ground, rolled onto to his side and then to his back. As he looked up, I could see the fear in his eyes. Tears began to well up as he battled to regain his composure. My chest! I can't breathe! Without expression on his face, the sheriff replied, It's all right, coach. We'll get you some help. Then he yelled, Simon, get over here! From out of the crowd came Simon. He and I both stood at five and a half feet tall. Our hair was about the same in length, cropped short above the ears, but his was darker than mine. Yes, sir, replied Simon, who looked nervous. I want you to run as fast as you can to the snack shop. Call emergency services and tell them we have a man down. And grab a couple of towels, explained the sheriff. As Simon ran off, the team and I continued to stand by and watch over Coach, somehow hoping to comfort him by our presence as he writhed around on the ground. My foot still ached from the fall that I had taken. I began to feel, feel a chill run up my spine as I stood there and gazed at him. It left me with goosebumps crawling up and down the length of my body. It made me recall the winter of 07, when I was just seven years old. We had the horrible winter that froze most of the crops and left people living off the rations provided by the government. We were the lucky ones. I can only describe it now as nightmarish. The world was overpopulated, at least that's what the authorities told us. We were simply told that changes would be made, and that a final solution would be enforced. The famine hit the cities the hardest. Because we were considered an absolute necessity, we were taken care of. It wasn't much, but it was better than what most got. It got so bad that some fed on the dead. My dad was one of the men from Ripfield who ventured there to feed the disos in despair. Many thought only of themselves. Still then, no one has ventured to the Windy City. We told the town of the horrors that we had witnessed. The people were so mortified and distraught by the rumors that even the thought of visiting was no longer considered a viable option. My dad and I went there not long after the first blizzard with a truckload of scraps and corn cobs to see if we could help some of the poor. We had harvested a decent amount of corn the year before, more than others did. My dad thought that it was a right to help others in need. As we entered the city limits, hundreds of people stood in the streets begging for food, while others who could no longer wait began to gorge themselves on the flesh of the dead. I saw people take clothes from the corpses to keep themselves warm. The police told us that we were better off going back home instead of wasting our time in this hellhole. My dad would not listen. He felt the need to help the less fortunate. I was shocked to see the horror of this cesspool. As we continued our mission to mercy, I looked upon the skyscrapers that littered the skyline. These man-made monoliths were so large that they overwhelmed me and made me feel rather small and insignificant. The police were in over their heads. The only thing they could do was to shoot the looters. They tried their best to keep the peace, but it was too much for them to handle on their own. I felt sorry for them and for the people that they had to kill. We were looking to feed themselves and, that, and their starving families. Our president, Herod Harvester, addressed the nation. We shall continue to struggle through these difficult times and persevere as we battle against this crisis. Those words stuck in my mind and still resonate with me today. As my dad and I handed out the food, I saw a side of my dad that I had never seen before. For the first time, I saw him really smile, with compassion in his eyes, and satisfaction in the work that he was doing. He worked for nobody but himself, doing what he loved most. We had parked in a lot not far from the main thoroughfare and waited on the people. As they came, we handed them the steamed cobs that we boiled in a kettle. As they boiled, they released a smell that transformed that alley which reeked of death into a sweet-smelling Nebraskan field. Those standing nearby began to salivate as the smell wafted in the air. They could not wait for the opportunity to sink their teeth into the cobs that had been given to them, to suck on for all their juices. 
People of all creeds and ethnicities came to our truck for this meal. Everybody, that is, except the wealthy. Some were grateful to get this relief, while others were less than satisfied, and even went so far as to throw scraps back at us. It was better than starving to death or eating the flesh of a petrified corpse. I never forgot it, and still have nightmares. Breaking my train of thought, the sheriff shouted, Hyler, where is Simon? I looked up and noticed Simon coming from the direction of the snack bar. He seemed to have taken an eternity, but had only been gone for a few minutes. He's here now, I replied. Here are the towels. The guy said they're on the way, Simon said. Now make some space so that my guys can get through when they do show up, said the sheriff. Okay, let's clear out, said a parent. Coach, I'm real sorry. The only thing I can do for you is lay a towel under your head. You know the law, said the sheriff, who looked as if he were uncomfortable with the whole situation. Being the town sheriff, he had to put his feelings aside and, and at least appear to have it all together. Help me, gasped the coach, who continued to hold his chest. As I watched the chaos of the crowd, I heard the screaming of a woman as she approached. I turned and saw Miss Adams, the coach's wife. I had never heard of her first name. Come to think of it, I didn't know our coach's first name either. He had never mentioned it. For four seasons, the team had called him Coach. If you asked him what his first name was, he would say, You don't need to know my name. The important thing is that you listen, show respect, call me Coach, because that's what I am to you. If you respect me, then you'll get the respect that you deserve and the tools necessary to succeed, not just in the sport, but in life. We gave him this respect, and it paid off in dividends. This particular day was to be the last game that he would coach. He would retire with the championship trophy for his mantle, so as to have a lasting memorial to his hard work. We went from worst to first because of his infectious enthusiasm and sacrifices. We used to be known as a bunch of no-talent nobodies, but to coach we were winners. There were no limits or boundaries that we could not overcome with his guidance. He never complained about the losses and errors. I think he was proud of what we had accomplished despite the less than stellar results. We had come close, but had yet to attain a coveted prize. I could have ended the game if I had caught the ball. Worst of all, Coach was on his back in pain and now was powerless to do anything about it. Wait, let me through! I want to see my husband! exclaimed Miss Adams as she tried to lay her hands on him. The sheriff lost no time. He grabbed her around the waist and jerked her from the reach of her husband. Just hold your horses, responded the sheriff. Let me go! I want to see my husband! She insisted as she sobbed uncontrollably. You know the law, Angela. If you touch him, I'll have to take you to the station to face charges for breaking Herod Reaper Law 2071. You know I can't ignore the law, even when I'm off duty," said the sheriff in a matter-of-fact tone. Coach's wife was Angela Adams? That's strange, I thought. Had I heard that name before? I couldn't put my finger on it, but I knew it had to do with something important. I don't care about your stupid law. Let me go so I can be with my husband. Miss Adams insisted, and tears fell down her cheeks. You know I can't let you do that, ma'am replied the sheriff. Sheriff, let her go and forget the law just this once, pleaded Coach as he struggled to push through the tightness in his chest. Sorry, folks, said the sheriff. I wish I could, but the law is the law, and I have to uphold it no matter what. You are a cruel with no sense of compassion. Now let me go, shouted Miss Adams in a huff. I understood her anger, but she knew the law. It had been created by the authorities and handed down to us to obey. We all learned about it in history class, but we were never told what the law's actual purpose was. We were told it was of the utmost importance that we not touch or help the mortally wounded no matter the circumstances. This act could be done only as deemed necessary by government and military personnel. The penalty for an act of compassion is death, no exceptions. This tradition had been handed to us by the late Arthur Augustus Harvester, the former president who changed our lives forever. Anyone caught breaking the law would be taken to trial before the tribunal which always ended with a guilty verdict.